Welcome. It's great being here. In 1940, the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a play called No Exit. This play begins with three individuals in the afterlife. These three souls find themselves in a room with no door and where the windows are completely bricked up, thus the title No Exit. To make matters worse, these three really irritate each other. And because they irritate each other, they try to change each other. That doesn't go so well and only escalates their frustration. They slowly start to realize that hell isn't the fire and brimstone or the torture chamber they'd imagined. Hell is in fact other people. People who won't do or change or behave the way we want them to. Now, this is only a play, but think about it for a minute. How often do we find ourselves with people who irritate or annoy us? And so we try to fix them in some fundamental way. And what happens when our attempts to fix them don't work? Why does this matter? Why, why am I even sharing this with you? Regardless of the roles we're in, more and more is required of us. And we're all measured in a lot of different ways, but the ultimate measure for every one of us is by the results we get. So, how do you get your results? Unless you are a pro golfer, or maybe you run a company where you are the only employee, the rest of us get our results with and through other people. So, we're measured by our results, we get our results with and through other people, and other people are really difficult to change or, or even influence. How many of you relate to this? I mean, it's frustrating, isn't it? If we're in Sartre's play, we want to go to another room, find new people, better people, smarter people, people who get it, people who don't need to be changed. But we soon discover that they've got their challenges too, so we go to the next metaphorical room, and the next room, and the next room, continually looking for these perfect people who don't exist. And while it may not always feel like hell, it certainly doesn't feel like paradise. So what do we do? The late Dr. Stephen R. Covey, a best-selling author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and a man I had the great privilege of working directly with for many years, said everything starts with the individual because all meaningful change comes from the inside out. Systemic organizational change cannot happen without changes in individual behavior. Now, let's go back to this room in Sartre's play for a minute. No door, windows completely bricked up. One other important detail in this room. In this room, there are no mirrors. So even if they wanted to, these people who are so busy trying to change and fix each other, they don't have the opportunity to look in the mirror and say, what do I need to do differently? What do I need to change? Where can I get better? So that's what I'd like to talk about for a couple of minutes. Taking a look in the mirror and starting with ourselves. For the past 30 years, I've observed and coached leaders and others at various levels in organizations. And from the literally hundreds of principles and tools and paradigms contained in Franklin Covey's World Class Solutions, I've identified those specific practices that I've seen over and over again become the real catalysts for influencing and sometimes changing others. And we do that by starting with ourselves. From these practices that I've seen continually bubble up, I've written a book called Get Better. 15 Proven Practices to Build Effective Relationships at Work. Now, particularly in the business world, people will say, okay, relationships, that's nice, but I've got a business to run. I've got a division to lead. I've got this project we're working on or a quarter to close. We're going to talk about relationships? Well, again, I remind you that we get our results with and through others. So relationships are absolutely foundational to all of these very important goals that we all need to achieve. 
The other thought I'd like you to suspend or to put aside is, you know who really needs to be here? Or, oh, I wish so-and-so were here. They really have a problem with this. And while that's very true, let's not be like the people in Sartre's play, pointing the finger, looking at changing each other. When the most influential, effective people in the world look in the mirror every day and say, what do I need to change? What do I need to do differently? Now, the book uh, goes on sale uh, officially on November 7th, but those who order it, pre-order now, get a, a set of cards. I feel like I'm doing an infomercial now, but I'm not. But they get a set of cards that contain all 15 practices. And I wanted to introduce you to these cards and to the practices very quickly. We won't have time to go through all 15, of course, but I want you to at least know the titles so that it'll give you a little insight into what, what the practices are about. Practice one, wear glasses that work. The way we see things influences everything we do. I'm going to talk just a little bit about practice one in a minute. Practice two, carry your own weather. Practice three, behave your way to credibility. Practice four, play your roles well. Practice five, see the tree, not just the seedling. All about seeing potential in others. Practice six, avoid the pinball syndrome. This is one of the practices I'm challenged with a lot. Avoid the pinball syndrome. You'll want to read the book to find out what that's all about. Practice seven, think we, not me. Number eight, take stock of your emotional bank accounts. Practice number nine, examine your real motives. Number 10, talk less, listen more. 11, get your volume right. It's all about the blind spots that we have. Number 12, extend trust. Practice 13, make it safe to tell the truth, meaning make it safe for others to tell you the truth, to get feedback. Practice number 14, align inputs with outputs. And the last practice, number 15, is to start with humility. Those are the, the 15 practices. Again, we won't be able to go through all of them, but I wanted you to be familiar with them. Let's talk just briefly about practice one. Wear glasses that work. Each of these cards and the chapters in the book begin with a couple of questions. The questions on this practice are, are you seeing people and situations accurately? Have you ever discovered that your version of the truth wasn't so true or complete after all. I remember my first actual experience with real glasses that worked when I was in the second grade. I was seven years old. And I got my first set of glasses, and for the first time in my life, I could actually see the leaves up on the trees. You're wondering how blind was I? I was pretty blind. But previous to that, I saw this green blob or mass up on the trees. And here's the thing. I thought that's what everybody saw when they looked up at the trees. So that was my version of the truth. And then finally I had on real glasses and could see that what was really there wasn't what I had thought at all. This is the principle behind wearing glasses that work. Seeing what's really there versus what we've convinced ourselves is there. Whether it's a circumstance, a person, we all have accurate paradigms and we all have false paradigms. Wearing glasses that work helps us know the difference. What we see drives everything else. It determines what we do, and what we do, of course, gives us the results we get. But it's all driven by the way we see things. For example, if I'm a micromanager, think about how I see my team. They're incompetent, they're lazy, they're idiots, they don't know what they're doing. And so if that's how I see my team as a micromanager, what kinds of things do I do? Well. I hover over them, I criticize them, I triple check, I'm quick to judge. And if I do those things, what kind of results does this team get? Probably poor, mediocre at best. And then, what do I say to myself as the micromanager? See, look how bad the results are. Can you imagine if I hadn't micromanaged? I've got to do even more of this. And it's this 
cycle or this self-fulfilling prophecy driven by what I'm seeing, the glasses or the lenses that I'm wearing. I'll give you one other quick example. As we all know or should know, culture is absolutely our competitive advantage in any organization. Culture is your ultimate competitive advantage. Well, what if as a leadership team I believe that and I see culture as HR's responsibility? Yep, I know culture is important and that's what HR does. They'll send out the quarterly newsletter or they'll put on the company picnic or they'll do the award ceremony or whatever I view as culture and HR's got it. Well, if that's my view or if those are the lenses that I'm wearing, then what do I do? Well, I'm pretty hands-off as a leader or a leadership team because HR's got it. And what kind of a culture do we have? Honestly, probably okay because this is how a lot of organizations think about their culture. So we don't really feel like we're any worse off than the, than the organization down the street. However, what if I have what we call a paradigm shift and I see culture as everyone's responsibility, certainly every leader's responsibility, realizing that my actions and the actions of my leadership team all shape and contribute to the culture. Well, then what do I do if that's my, the lenses through which I'm looking? Well, we're very hands-on. We realize that every meeting, every email, every interaction with our partners, with our employees, impacts and influences the culture. And if I've got a whole leadership team that I'm coaching all the time, helping them remember and realize that they are shaping the culture in their very actions, well, we end up having a highly engaged, highly engaged culture, all driven by what we see. What we see drives what we do and gives us the results we get. Now, back to this card. On the bottom of these cards has what happens when we don't put this practice to work. So when we don't wear glasses that work, you hold a limited or incomplete view of yourself or others. You hinder potential. You judge people inaccurately. You act on incorrect, premature, or narrow information and jeopardize results. You lose the capacity to see multiple solutions to any problem. It can be very limiting when we're not wearing glasses that work. On the back of each of these cards, is a, an application for that practice. This particular application for wear glasses that work, identify a challenging relationship or a situation. Then list all of the reasons why that relationship is challenging. After you've listed those reasons, I coach people to go ahead and circle those things which are facts. And I tell them, now by facts, it means you would show this to five or six other people and they would wholeheartedly agree with you. And then everything that's left, while they may be accurate, they're opinions. And you'll be surprised when you do this how many opinions you have that you previously were thinking of as facts. This is how we start to have a paradigm shift and maybe choose to look through a different set of lenses. That's the power in wearing glasses that work. That's practice one of the book, Get Better, 15 Proven Practices to Build Effective Relationships at Work. You can go to any practice that resonates with you, but start with practice one, because the way we see things drives everything we do, drives what we do with all of the other 14 practices. It's all about looking in the mirror. We can continue to spend our time pointing the finger, but all meaningful change comes from the inside out. So we start with ourselves, and as Gandhi put it best, we be the change that we seek in others. Thank you so much for your time.